Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation. My name is Yemi Obi, and today the Africans are going to present the legal framework for the Nigerian oil and gas industry. So who are we? Well, we the Africans, we're a team of friends, um, professionals, and who are quite passionate about oil and gas and energy development in sub-Saharan Africa. Our aims are to bring together um, other engineers and scientists like ourselves, um, people with commercial and financial focus, and other stakeholders um, who have interest across the oil and gas value chain in sub-Saharan Africa. We're hoping to share knowledge and expertise to create value, and also to support growth and development of the industry. As I said today, I'm your host. Um, a brief background about myself. So I'm a chartered engineer um, with over 11 years of engineering, project management and construction experience. Um, I have worked in the oil and gas industry um, both in Nigeria and um, here in the UK and all over the world really, delivering design, construction, commissioning, subcontract management projects um, and also business development opportunities for me and well, for my company and my clients. So I am certified in leadership and management from um, by the Chartered Management of sorry Chartered Management Institute, and I hold a bachelor's and master's degree in engineering from University of Leeds. Thank you all again for coming to join us today, um, both our existing listeners and those that have just come um, anew. So joining me today are three other speakers, distinguished in their own rights, um, as lawyers and therefore solicitors and barristers. I have Fadi Kemi Majulagbe who is um, an associate counsel at Adroit and Deft. Fadekemi was called to the Nigerian bar in 2007. Um, she is a master in the art of negotiation herself. And she has several years of experience in commercial law, um, oil and gas, property law. The second speaker will be Shamsia Sadiq Mohammed. Shamsia is the managing partner at Keith and Council. Um, Shamsia has over nine years experience um, and she has, sits as a company secretary on numerous boards, including ProClap Pro Limited. She has over nine years experience, like I said, and she has um, experience in oil and gas, real estate, corporate governance, immigration and civil litigation. She's also a member of the Nigerian Institute of Chartered Arbitrators in Lagos. The next speaker would be Fola Shade Akin Musire. Falashade Akin Musure is a seasoned legal practitioner. She's also a Chartered Secretary and Governance Practitioner with a Bachelor's Degree from Olabisi Onabanjo University in Nigeria. She's been, uh, she's been called to the bus in 2003 and she's the Fellow of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administration um, and Notary Public of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. Falashade has vast experience in oil and gas, corporate commercial, um, legal practice, insurance law, labor law, real estate, and construction law since 2003. So these would be our speakers for today. And covering the agenda would be legal framework overview and the PIB, which is the Petroleum Industry Bill, local content um, and business considerations, and also tax licenses and the environment. So effectively, how does the law protect um, the environment in which the oil and gas is exploited? Today's session is meant to be an interactive session. Um, so please, by all means, leave your questions in the Q&A section. Um, and the team in the background who are supporting us today will be picking that up. Um, and at the end, we will hope to answer some of those for you. But if we're not able to, um, please leave us an email at ethical at ethicos.co.uk and would hope to get back to you. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to the first speaker, Fadi Kemi. Fadi Kemi, are you ready? Fadi Kemi, are you there? You come off mute, please, Fadike. Good evening, everybody. Um, Thank you. Fadike Majalagbe. I'm a legal practitioner, associate counsel at Adroit and Deft, a firm of legal practitioners, notaries, and governance, governance practitioners. My presentation this evening will focus on explaining some of the statutes and regulations that govern the Nigerian oil and gas industry, as well as explaining the roles of some of the regulatory agencies. I'll also touch on the petroleum bill. So 
So the first question we would ask is, um, what is a legal framework? A legal framework is a specific set of laws that lay down general obligations and principles. And in this particular case, I will be talking about some of the regulations and guidelines that control activities in the Nigerian oil and gas industry. The Nigerian oil and gas industry was established in 1956 when crude oil was discovered in Oloibiri in present-day Bayelsa State in the Niger Delta region. And since that time, the industry has grown to become one of the largest oil and gas producers in Africa. The Nigerian oil and gas industry is a heavily regulated industry with various intertwining statutes and regulations. Principal among the, these laws are the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the Petroleum Act. Uh, so let me go into what the Constitution says about that. The 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Section 44, Subsection 3, vests control of all minerals, mineral oils, and gas in under or on any land in Nigeria, in its territorial waters, or in its exclusive economic zone in the government. These resources are to be managed in the manner prescribed by the National Assembly. The National Assembly has enacted several laws to direct how the industry is to be managed. And the principal statute governing all these laws is the Petroleum Act. The Petroleum Act and all its subsidiary legislations including the petroleum drilling and production regulation and the petroleum refining regulations govern petroleum operations in Nigeria, including but not limited to exploration, development, production, storage, transportation, refining and marketing, and also regulations for the award of marginal fields. And um, if we define the marginal field according to the guidelines for farm out and operations of Marginal Fields Act, it's any field that has oil and gas reserves booked and reported annually to the DPR and has remained unproduced for a period of over 10 years. The Petroleum Act vests ownership and control exclusively in the government and the exercise of the powers consequent upon this title in the, federal, in the Honorable Minister of Petroleum Resources. There are some other, other laws here. The Petroleum Drilling and Production Regulations uh, they cover the regulation of the administrative procedures for petroleum drilling and production licenses. Section 43 requires that not later than five years after the commencement of production in an area, the licensee or the leasee shall submit to the minister any feasibility study, program or proposals for the utilization of any natural gas, whether associated with oil or not discovered in the area. Also, Section 56 allows any person authorized by the Department of Petroleum Resources to enter any facility to conduct an inspection. This act is governed by the Department of Petroleum Resources. The NNPC Act, uh, this was um, largely created as a response to, was, sorry, this, was, this establishes um, how the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation is the national oil company. So this act establishes how this corporation participates in petroleum operations on behalf of the government. Then the NDDC Act, that's the Niger Delta Commission Development Act, uh, was created as a response to the demands of the people of, the, of Nigeria's Niger Delta. And the, the main point in this act is that it provides for the payment of um, 3% of the annual budget of all oil and gas companies for the development of the Niger Delta areas well, or where oil and gas are being exploited. Some mandates of the NDDC, um, they include the training of youth, the curbing of hostilities and um, militancy and the development of infrastructure. The deep offshore and inland basin production sharing contract acts. The purpose of this act is to give effect to the fiscal incentives given to the oil and gas companies operating in the deep offshore and inland basin areas. Also, um, other corporations or companies holding OPLs or OMLs, you know, the essence of this act is to determine what the sh uh, sharing formula will be between the government and the companies. And this is very important because um, the act regulates the rights, um, duties, and the obligations of licensee in regards to fields and the government's rights to harness revenue from the field that was um, awarded to the licensee. 
Then lastly, we have the Nigerian Gas Flare Commercialization Program and um, the flare gas regulations. And the objectives are the reduction of um, environmental and social impact caused by the flaring of natural gas, the prevention of waste of natural resources, and the creation of social and economic benefits from flare gas capture. In harnessing the value chain, the benefits in the gas sector, the DPR has um, issued some recent directives to that effect that all exploration and production companies are to install gas flaring meters to assert in detail the quantity of gas flared in the oil fields in real time towards the possible award of gas fields under a JOA to prospective operators. Now I'll go to some key regulators. We've got the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Resources um, has primary responsibility for policy formulation, for supervisory oversight and regulating the Nigerian petroleum industry. The minister who issues regulations and guidelines, but all the directives postured to the Petroleum Act and other enabling laws. Um, every qualified um, person wishing to carry out any form of company, wishing to carry out any form of petroleum operations can do so only on the basis of authorization granted by the minister. Then the Department of Petroleum Resources, the, um, the minister acts primarily through the DPL and they perform the day-to-day -day monitoring and um, routine oversight. Some other regulators, we have the Federal Ministry of Environment. Their primary functions are to ensure environmental protection and the conservation of natural resources and sustainable development. As I mentioned earlier, we have the NNPC. And um, what I can add to this is that the NNPC um, adopts various contractual models for development of oil and gas resources. Um, like I said, the agreements, the traditional J joint venture agreements, the service contracts, the production sharing contracts, and the sole risk contracts. Then we have the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board. Uh, they ensure compliance with the level of Nigeria content in the industry, which is very important. Uh, they mandate the compulsory participation of Nigerian citizens in the upstream sector. It was established by the Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry Content Development Act. Then we have the National Oil Spill Detection Response Agency, established by the National Assembly in 2006 to coordinate, um, to coordinate sorry, the impl implementation of the National Oil Spill Contingency Plan in accordance with um, International Convention on Oil Pollution Preparedness, Response and Cooperation and Nigeria is a signatory to this. It's called the OPRC-90. So now I'll, um, I'll move to the PIB. That's the Petroleum Industry Bill. If enacted, this bill will change things in the industry. Right now, as it stands, the bill has passed its second reading in the National Assembly. The PIB aims to harmonize and significantly restructure the industry, as well as eliminate, eliminate duplicity of rules, because right now we've got a lot of um, intertwining, so to speak, <laughs> with all the laws available at, as we speak. And the bill also aims to make sweeping reforms by repealing certain laws, like the Petroleum Act, and also to create new institutions to govern the operations of the industry. The Eighth National Assembly divided the PIB into four, um, into four pieces, should I say smaller pieces of legislation just to um, further make things simpler and um, easier to carry out. First of all, we have the PIB Governance Bill um, for governance and institutional framework. We've got the Fiscal Bill for robust fiscal framework to ensure development and exploitation of nat petroleum resources in a rational and sustainable manner. The administration bill uh, for the administration of upstream licenses and leases for the organization of midstream, for midstream organizations and operations and gas markets, and also to set up procedures for licensing in the downstream. Then the host community bill, for the benefit share among government, oil and gas companies, and host communities. On the 20th of March, the PIGB was harmonized and passed by the House of, the, well, the National Assembly, that's the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, after the passage of the bill, 
It was sent to the president for assent. However, the president withheld assent on the grounds that the funding of the Nigerian Petroleum Regulatory Commission through its proposed retention of 10% of the funds that it collects on behalf of the federal government was regarded as inordinately high and would deprive the federal, state, and local governments of a significant proportion of available revenue. And also, the bill will extend the scope of activities of the Petroleum Equalization Fund, which is in contradiction to the policies of the federal government. Reports, um, however, suggest that the Petroleum Administration Bill, the Fiscal Bill, and the Host Community, community Bill have been, they, that they have passed second reading at the Senate. In conclusion, I'd like to say that um, recently in an article, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, um, Timmy Pre Silva, mentioned in an article that the non passage of the Petroleum Industry Bill has hampered and delayed investments coming into the oil sector. And um, the minister also said that the executive will incorporate additional policies and regulations to the bill and send it back to the National Assembly for consideration so that some of the present challenges being faced in the industry can be mitigated. To this end, the PIGB proposes three main things. One is to curb the existing power of the Minister of Petroleum Resources by limiting his primary function to that of um, like a national policy advisor and um, a driver, so to speak, on petroleum matters. And also to establish the Nigeria Petroleum Regulatory Commission. And um, this commission will be, will be vested with the combined functions of um, Petroleum Inspectorate, the Department of Petroleum Resources, and the Petroleum Products Pricing Regulatory Agency. A key function of the proposed commission is the issuance, modification, amendment, suspension, review, and cancellation of upstream licenses. These are functions currently being exercised by the minister. Lastly, the unbundling of the NNPC and um, establishing of three commercial entities in the state. These are the Nigeria Petroleum Assets Management Company, the National Petroleum Company, the National Petroleum Company, and sorry, excuse me, the Nigerian Petroleum Assets Managing Company, the National Petroleum Company, and the National Petroleum Company, sorry. This, it's proposed that the management company will be responsible for managing the NNPC's interest in production sharing contracts and um, back in rights assets, while the NPC will take over all, all other NNPC assets. Um, this is um, excluding the back in rights assets. So um, I'll just um, finish by saying that um, Everyone is, um, especially people in the oil and gas sector, eagerly awaiting the passage of this bill. And when this bill is passed, apart from doing all that I've mentioned earlier, it will foster a conducive business environment for petroleum industry operators, as well as promote transparency and accountability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fadike, for that lovely presentation. Um, it would be quite interesting indeed to see how the government's progress that PIB bill in the next, um, well, days, weeks, years to come. <laughs> so I shall next pass everyone to Shamsia. So Shamsia will talk about the local content requirements with a particular focus on business considerations for the energy, well, for the oil and gas industry. Shamsia, are you ready? Um, thank you, Yemi. Thank you very much. Please share your screen and go ahead. Okay. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shamsia Sadiq Mohammed, and today I shall be talking to you about um, local content in the oil and gas industry, and my focus will be business considerations. Now, um, I'll start by defining what local content uh, means. Now, um, simply put, in accordance with the provision of the Act, local content is a quantum, composite, um, quantum of composite value added or com composite of, um, sorry, quantum of composite value added or created for the promotion of Nigerian economy through utilizing of um, manpower, material resources, um, manufactured goods, and services in the oil and gas industry. 
Now, um, what um, the governing legislation, governing law, respect to local content in Nigeria industry is the Nigerian oil and gas industry content development act, which was enacted in 2010 under the previous um, president, Gula Jonathan, um, in the year 2010. And um, the act in itself enacted the re regulatory body known as the Nigerian. But yeah, it looks like we've lost Shamsia in that broadcast and her um, connection did seem a bit shaky. So if oh, Shamsia- sorry, I think I broke in somehow. Hello? Yes, we can still Hello, hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Um, so if you leave sorry. your video oh, off, my, might I suggest you leave your video off and then just keep talking through your slides if you share your slides and we might be able to hear you um, even if we can't see okay. you. Okay, okay. I'm so sorry. I think it's That's my okay. internet. Are you able to share your slides? Or I can share your okay. slides for you and that you let talk. Me, let me go ahead and share. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So can I um, can I can I comment now? Yes. Go, go ahead, please. Okay. Or you can help me, please, because I'm struggling to um, move um, the slides. No problem at all. Okay. I shall okay. move your slides in consideration. So bear with me, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. We are not trained media professionals, but uh, we are hoping <laughs> to know the chair, notwithstanding. Okay. Now you've gone ahead. That's okay. Can you see my screen? Okay, this is fine. Thank you. No, yes, I can. Okay, so let me start all over again. Um, I'm sorry, everyone. So my name is Shamsia Sadiq Mohammed, and today I'll be talking to you about local content, the Local Content Act in the oil and gas industry. And my basic focus would be business consideration. Now, um, first of all, I'd like you to understand what local content is about by defining what local content is. Local content essentially um, is a quantum of composite value added or created in the promotion and services in the oil and gas industry. Now, the governing law for local content in the oil and gas industry is the Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry Content Development Act 2010. It was enacted in 2010 under the previous president of Nigeria, um, President Goodluck Jonathan. Now the act enacted a regulatory body known as the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board, whose um, head office is in Bielsa, Niger Delta region in Nigeria. And um, so the, the board is um, a lot of responsibility, but primarily the board is responsible for impl uh, guiding, implementing, and promoting the um, compliance of the provisions of the act in the oil and gas industry. Now, the essence of the act itself is to promote Nigerian participation in the oil and gas industry. And when I say participation, I mean uh, not to, just talking about um, human resources i'm talking about material resources and manufacturing goods and services i mean utilization utilizing it to the best of our abilities because these are resources that are provided um, in the country so then with respect to foreign investment in the industry so um, as a foreign an independent foreign investor who wishes to engage in the business of that you can only do so through a nigerian by incorporating a nigerian um, company. Now, the act in itself makes reference to what a Nigerian company is defined as under um, KAMA, under section 54 sub 1 of KAMA, which simply states that a Nigerian company is a, a company incorporated under um, CAC, I'm sorry, it's under the Corporate Affairs Commission um, with a minimum share holding of 51% being held by a Nigerian or Nigerians. So as an independent private and, and investor, you're not just coming and, and dealing in oil and gas with that Nigerian company. Then go forward, and I would like to touch on key aspects of that with regards to business 
considerations. Now, first, uh, we have um, the first considerations that are usually given to Nigeria, such as award of licenses. It's in practice and also in accordance with the Petroleum Act, uh, foreign investors are not awarded licenses. They're not awarded licenses. Only Nigerian, qualified Nigerian uh, operators are awarded licenses. Then with respect to services provided by Nigerians, the priority are given to uh, service companies in that regard, goods in the oil, oil and gas industry. Then the issue of um, training of Nigerian staff is um, pertinent that uh, in situations um, where we Okay, apologies everyone. It would appear that we have lost Shamsia again. Um, what we will do is we will probably just skip to the next presenter. Um, who would um, talk to us about other aspects of the law. If we are able to establish connection with um, Shamsia, we'll come back to her later on. So, Fodashade, are you hello. able? Yes, hello, hello. Shamsia. Shamsia, hello. Yeah, I'm back on. You're back on, okay. <laughs> Let's give you one last sorry, try, so otherwise, sorry. no problem. It's, um, really we, some of us can't wait for, going... for for 5G now, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, let's go back to your screen and we'll try and wrap up um, before we move on. Let's let's give you a, one last try. Oh, the beginning, right? Uh, just take it from number two, please. Um, to the next, my second slide. From business Hello? consideration, business considerations, number two, please. Hello. Okay, Shamsia, let's let's leave it let's leave it here for now. Um, okay. in in, inter in the interest of time. Can you hear me? You're breaking up very badly. So let's leave it here in the interest of time. Um, and if we're able to establish connection back, we'll, we'll bring you back to conclude. But um, for Lashade, sorry. Well, Ashade, are you able to, to start on the next one? Hello, Kay? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, let me, let me work on that. Thank you. Please share your screen, for Ashade. Thank you. Okay, well, sorry about that. Good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Fola Shade Akimashire, um, managing partner, Adroit and Debt. Um, we're a firm of legal practitioners, notary, and governance practitioners. My presentation today will focus on legislation regarding tax and royalties, the environment, the commissioning and abandonment transparency in the management of revenue, as well as incorporating a Nigerian company in the industry. The previous speakers have established that ownership of extractive rights and resources in Nigeria is vested in the federal government. To this end, the federal government derives revenue from the industry through taxes, royalties, levies, and rates from oil companies, oil license operators, contractors, and other participants in the industry. The fiscal regime on taxes and royalties in Nigeria is governed by the Petroleum Profit Tax Act and the Company Income Tax Act. There are other legislations as well, but for now, let's um, focus on that. By virtue of the Company's Income Tax Act, the Board of Inland Revenue is charged with responsibility of policy formation regarding taxes under the industry. 
by virtue of the Petroleum Profit Tax Act, um, which I'll refer to as PP PPTA, exploration and production companies are generally subject to petroleum profit tax at a rate of 85% of their chargeable profits. Um, however, Petroleum Profit Tax Act provides for a reduced um, tax rate of 65.75%. Um, invariably, this means that um, this is um, in the first five years, apart, uh, af, um, rather than pay 85%, you know, um, tax, you'll be subjected to about 29. My math is not very good. So my math is not very good right now. So you take off 65.75%, um, you know, payable within the first um, five years of operations, allowing for recovery of all pre-production capitalized expenses of field operations. Companies engaged in the midstream and downstream sector, however, are subject to 30% income tax, you know, based on the company's income tax act. Service companies and contractors such as drilling and engineering contractors um, that do not um, engage in winning or obtaining and transportation of petroleum or chargeable oil licenses are also taxed in accordance with the company's Income Tax Act. Apart from um, taxes, we also noted that um, government makes um, revenue from the industry through levies. The government imposes levies on companies in the industry uh, some of the levies include a 2% education tax on all accessible profits of oil and gas companies in the industry. This is um, towards um, improving and developing the educational sector in Nigeria. There's also a 3% Niger Delta development levy on total annual profits. Um, this is towards development of host communities in the Niger Delta to ensure and to reduce militancy and, and all the other risks associated in that region. Um, we also have a Nigerian content development levy of 1% on every contract sum awarded in the upstream sector. This is payable to the Nigerian Content Development Fund towards um, enhancing uh, participation of Nigerians in the industry, you know, training of, um, of professionals and, and all other, um, as, as the board may deem fit. It is worthy to just note, um, however, there's a proposed increase of that levy from 1% to 2%, you know, in the Nigerian Content Development Enforcement Bill, which is presently before the National Assembly. We're not going to go into detail of that. Um, but, um, and then, okay. So we also have um, the Petroleum Drilling and Production Regulations. It also provides um, and prescribes payment for levies of, um, rents and royalties in the industry. So because rights under the exploration field, be it the economic zone or otherwise vest in the federal government, license holders and participants uh, in the industry are subject to rent for the duration of their licenses. Um, there are various rates contained under the drilling and regulations, um, drilling and production regulations I believe uh, some of those um, rates are here. Some of them are here. Okay, so, but with regards to royalties, royalties are levies um, at a percentage rate of your quantum of oil and gas produced and sold. The petroleum drilling and production regulations prescribe the royalty rates for crude oil and hydrocarbons produced from oil prospecting licenses and oil, mile, uh, oil mining licenses. Companies are, however, subject to various rates depending on their sector, uh, be it the petroleum or the gas sector, as well as the location of your field. That's if you're operating onshore or offshore, your royalty rate is not um, the same. Um, it, it depends on, you know, on your, the location of your field, like I said, be it onshore or offshore. Other determining factors are the depth of the waters you operate in. You know, if you're operating offshore, definitely you are operating on the waters and that can pose um, um, additional difficulties. So generally you get to pay reduced royalties in such um, areas and in such fields. Um, another factor that determines royalty payment as provided by that um, regulation is uh, the amount of, the volume of barrels produced daily um, from your field. So if you produce, if your production level is high, definitely your royalty payments would be high. Um, generally, there's a 20% royalty rate of all um, production, production revenue. 
on for offshore areas and the rate reduces as the operational depth increases. The Production Sharing Act also prescribes different sets of royalty rates for the deep offshore and inland um, basin acreages. Um, marginal field operations, fiscal regime regulations, we also have that regulation. Um, that regulation also specifies um, different uh, royalty rates for marginal field operations. Um, and then with respect to the upstream gas sector, um, holders of an oil prospecting license or oil mining license in that sector are required to pay royalties of our 7%. Um, for those onshore, they pay 5%, you know, 5% royalty rates. So like I said, your royalty rate is not static. It depends basically on some of the factors that um, I just mentioned. Government also makes revenue from imports and exports of oil and gas products. We have um, um, the Nigerian Export Supervision Scheme Administrative Charge of um, 0.15%, uh, as well as um, you also have a 1% administrative charge for all imports of petroleum products into the country. Then um, under the Common External Tariff Scheme implemented by the Customs Service, importers of petroleum products pay between 0 to 10% of um, the value of their imports as import um, duty. So we can see that there are quite a number of regulations with respect to royalty payments, levies, and how government generally um, makes revenue from the industry. I, um, it would be better to have all these taxes, levies, and um, um, regulations in one legislative instrument. This will definitely help ease out um, compliance for participants in the industry as well as investors. This will help them make informed decision on you know, investing in the industry. They have an idea of uh, what their profits will be percentage wise, and then they can uh, make um, strategies and find ways to implement and um, of course at the end of the day be profitable in their, in their investment in the Nigerian oil and gas industry. Um, there's no doubt that um, um, operations in the oil and gas industry can have some negative impacts on the environment. To this end, there are laws and regulations that prescribe standards and measures to be taken by operators in the industry to prevent and control pollution. This act also creates some of the agencies empowered, you know, to set the standards and then enforce compliance to limit uh, the negative impacts of industry on, on the environment. The major regulatory agencies responsible for this include um, the DPR. We also have FEPA, that's the Federal Environmental Production and um, Protection Agency. We have the Federal Ministry of Environment, and we also have um, the National Oil Spill Deten um, Detection and Response Agency, that's NOSRA. Um, okay, this uh, NOSRA was created by the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency Establishment Act. Okay, um, some of the key legislations in um, the environmental aspect, you know, the oil and gas industry in Nigeria is the Environmental Impact Assessment Act of 1992. Um, this act sets out procedures and methods to enable the prior consideration of environmental impact assessments on the oil and gas industry on certain public or private projects. Um, and then by virtue of that act, um, we have the Environmental Protection Agency, which is FEPA. Um, the agency has powers to facilitate um, environmental assessment on both public and private projects. You know, they go in and they assess the environmental impact and then they issue your AI, EIA report. Um, the report when generated helps operators make the amendments, you know, to their operational plans when necessary. And if they're okay, they, they comment operations and, and then we're all good. But the overall um, importance of that um, act is to ensure that um, the environment is protected you know, before you commence your operation, you want to have an idea of your in, of the impact of your operations, be it onshore, offshore, um, transportation. If you're in the trans, um, down um, stream sector or midstream sector in your processing and um, 
of your hydrocarbons and all of that. So the, the effect of your operations and your activities on the um, environment is very important. Government takes it very important and has made um, some of these laws. So some of the um, other key legislations in that um, with respect to environment involved uh, includes the Oil in Navigate, Navigable Waters Act, Oil in Navigable Waters Act. Um, this act um, was enacted pursuant to the International Convention for the Prevention of the Pollution of the Sea of 1954. Um, Nigeria has adopted this um, international convention and by virtue of this act, certain offenses were created, you know, to protect um, the seas, uh, discharge of oil into prohibited seas areas. Um, seas and areas is an offense. Um, we also have um, discharge of oil into Nigerian waters, international waters, then failure to install oil pollution equipment on your ships or um, failure to use the, the, the appropriate carriage, like um, I think um, the recent um, double haul ships and carriage for the importation or the conveyance and transportation of your crude. Um, failure by ABO authorities to provide all reception facilities at, um, at um, the ship harbors. Failure to report the presence of oil. You know, when you have um, a, an oil spill or a discharge, you know, all of that um, attract our offenses and they definitely attract um, penalties and punishments um, as provided by, by, the, by that act. So another um, important act that we might want to just um, touch on is the Oil Pipelines Act of 1956. This act um, basically regulates the lane and um, use of pipelines for the transportation of mineral oils, natural gas, as the case may be, depending on your sector. Um, it regulates how you lay your pipes. Are they properly laid um, to avoid um, spillages and, um, and pollution generally? Um, of course, before you can lay your pipes, use your pipes, your pipes have to be um, inspected you know, by the regulatory authorities. In this space, um, the minister has total control um, with respect to inspection of your um, your pipes, and then um, they issue licenses. You know, they grant you licenses and permits to actually construct your pipe, inspect what you have constructed before you can um, commence operation. You know, on on the on the use of your pipelines. So basically, all of which is to protect the environment and. Um, the government takes this very seriously and has, of course, made regulations with respect to that. Another aspect of um, operations is uh, decommissioning and abandonment. Um, and then we also have an act, and this is um, governed by basically by the Petroleum Act and um, the Petroleum Drilling and Production Regulations. We do not have a specific um, law in Nigeria for decommissioning and um, abandonment. Even the Petroleum Act is not, I wouldn't say is, um, is all encompassing, but at least is um, a step in the right direction. Um, the Petroleum Act makes mention of decommissioning, but what um, the regulatory authorities have done is to adopt um, the um, Geneva Convention on the Continental Shelf Act, um, which is um, the Geneva Convention which relates um, use of the seas with respect to transportation of, um, um, petroleum products, hydrocarbons, you know, and then the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas, as well as the London Dumping Convention. Um, all of these um, conventions have been, um, and treaties have been adopted by Nigeria, and by virtue of these treaties, um, government is responsible for decommissioning and abandonment, you know, at the, at the end of the life of um, an operator's um, license or the, um, or the end of their field or their well. But government is not going to actually come in by, by virtue of their regulations, come in and, and do that on your behalf, but they would regulate your activities, ensure that you adopt best international practices. And where you fail, of course, um, there'll be penalties and um, levies, you know, with respect to that um, activity. So in practice, operators are um, usually set aside funds either annually or quarterly and um, towards the decommissioning and abandonment of um, facilities and assets at the end of the life of the field or of the oil well. So you have to start preparing for it because you cannot just um, at the end of your, your, your field because definitely oil wells will dry up. So when your oil well dries up, you cannot just abandon it and just, you know, decommission or remove your facilities or your assets, you know, from the field 
you have to do it in, a, in an environmental friendly and best international practice um, way and regulations. So um, under the petroleum drilling and production regulations, um, it's, um, that act prescribes that operators must seek permission of um, the minister, that is through the Department of Petroleum Resources, before you can abandon um, um, an oil field, you know, in the event of any, anything that could uh, cause that. Before you can abandon it, you have to obtain um, a permit from DPR. And then even before you resume, in the event that you abandon for maybe for lack of funding or for whatever reason, before you resume, you also have to obtain um, a permit you know, from the DPR for, for same. And then the, uh, the DPR in response will um, approve the DPR. <laughs> In that, um, excuse me, sorry. The DPR um, would um, would grant you um, um, a pre-approved abandonment program. You know, you know, to ensure that um, they will inspect, of course, inspect your field and then um, prescribe um, a preferred um, abandonment program to enable you to do that um, um, in accordance with um, industry best practices. Okay, so. Um, basically there are other acts and regulations to note you know with respect to the environment the associated gas reinjection act we have a we have the harmful waste and special criminal provisions act you know for um offenses relating to pollution and and the rest and failure to take appropriate uh, measures and safety measures as required um, environmental guidelines and standards for petroleum industry then the petroleum refining regulations um, which talks about how you refine your hydrocarbons you know to get other benefits from your crude as you know in an environmental um, safe way so that's it um, with respect to the environment today. So um, there are other regulations in the industry. Chief of all, we have um, anti-corruption measures taken by the federal government. So we'll just touch on one or two of those. Um, we have the Nigerian Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, um, established both one to the Nigerian um, Proactive the Nigerian Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative Act of 2020. This act um, provides basically for transparency and accountability in the management of the country's revenue from natural resources, including oil and gas. This um, act imposes um, reporting and disclosure obligations on all oil and gas companies um, you know, with respect to their revenues paid to the government, outstanding revenues, um, and then how the government actually utilizes um, some of the revenues, you know, derived from the industry. The, 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 um, the initiative is not just a Nigerian initiative. It is um, an initiative, um, it's an international initiative, and Nigeria adopted it in 2007 and began, um, um, implementation and compliance with same in 2010. So the end result of that um, legislation is basically to ensure that the government uses the revenue and resources from that um, um, from natural resources and extractive resources in the best interest of everyone in the in the nation as against for selfish reasons or just to cop corruption basically. Um, that's um, that's one of the reasons for that um, particular legislation. So next we have um, um, Petroleum Technology Development Fund Act. The establishment of the Petroleum Development um, um, Petroleum Technology Development Fund is for the training of Nigerians to qualify um, as professionals in the field of engineering, geology, science, and other. Um, aspects as well as management in the petroleum sector. The fund is meant to facilitate uh, funding for the development and upgrading of local institutions that are used in providing um, training and education to Nigerians, you know, to make them competent, capable, and skilled to participate actively in the industry. Um, how that is looking up is not, um, <laughs> we can't report on, on, on the um, benefits of that uh, particular legislation, but it's worthy of note that that legislation actually exists. And um, operators make um, um, remittances to the fund 
you know, with respect to boosting um, education and skill competence uh, and capacity training levels, increasing the capacity training levels of um, Nigerians in the industry. Um, this is essentially also very important because of the Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry Content Act, which seeks to increase and support the participation of Nigerians and indigenous companies in the industry. Okay, so um, touching on the Nigerian Oil and Gas um, Industry Content Development Act, we just um, talk briefly about company registration and foreign participation. Um, as, my, as the previous speaker noted, um, the procedure for establishing of a Nigerian in entity for the uh, purposes of oil and gas operation in Nigeria um, includes um, incorporating um, an entity with the Corporate Affairs Commission. Um, as she stated in her presentation, she said um, a Nigerian company is defined as a company formed and registered in Nigeria in accordance with the provisions of the Companies and Allied Matters Act with not less than 51% of um, shares in the hands of Nigerians. Um, this does not mean international companies cannot participate as a um, misconstrued a lot of times. You can partner with a, a Nigerian, existing Nigerian company as an investor to participate in the Nigerian oil and gas country, as long as you do not um, have more than 49% shares in that particular entity. So, um, and then of course, Nigerians can own 100% indigenous um, companies, you know, to participate in the industry. So in the event that um, as a, it's just, this is just an advice to, prospective investors in the country. Um, the Local Content Act is not um, against participation of um, investment from international companies in Nigeria, um, but just um, seeks to um, increase participation of Nigerians, ensure that Nigerians actually have a feel of industry and can benefit you know, from the opportunities in the industry you know, over and against um, the, the initial, um, initial um, um, the way it was, you know, before the Local Contact Act was passed. Okay, so registration with, um, um, so in, in incorporating a Nigerian company, you also have to register with the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, NIPC, uh, that's for companies with foreign uh, participation. If you have that, you have to register with them. Um, a company investing or doing business um, in Nigeria, it's important for you to do this in order to bring in your funds into Nigeria. Okay, so you do this through the Nigerian um, Investment Promotion Commission and then foreign exchange monitoring and miscellaneous pro um, provisions, you know, to bring in your forex. This um, allows a party to do so through an authorized dealer, it could be um, a commercial bank, um, you know, in Nigeria. Um, and the essence of this is to ensure that your funds are in the country in a legal, in a legal manner. So basically, um, and the third step is registration with the DPR for a permit, depending on your, um, your sector of preference. And um, in, in applying for a per permit from DPR, you have to obtain license uh, depending on your sector, like I said, and then you have to submit your Nigerian content plan. Um, then you also, and then there are, and there are other requirements. Um, chief of all is your financial and your technical capacity to operate in the industry. So that's um, with respect to um, participation in that um, industry. Okay, so I think um, gradually I'm coming to the end of my uh, presentation. So in conclusion, I would say that there are several legislations and regulations in the industry. Um, however, we couldn't have gone through all today. However, we commend the industry so far. Um, for the impact regulatory regime, we have indeed um, well, actually, actually, I'll just basically like to say, I know that there are quite a lot of issues, you know, in the industry, but um, I know that government is trying their best, you know, to amortize and codify our legal framework, you know, to the extent that uh, we know that in 2017, the Federal Executive Council approved Nigerian Petroleum Policy, the NPP and the NGP policies, you know, to set some strategies and goals in place for implementation of appropriate legal regulatory and commercial framework to resolve some of the barriers you know in the industry whilst um, this is a welcome development it is pertinent to note that um, 
the force of a law behind policies cannot be compared to having um, legislation in the industry that has gone through the legislative arm and the procedure as um, prescribed by our constitution. Because um, by virtue of the minister's powers as contained in the Petroleum Act, a new minister can easily obtain some of the regulations and policies, such as um, you know, the new uh, policy that we have with respect to deregulation of oil prices in the downstream sector, or you know, the phasing out of the subsidy regime in Nigeria. All of these can be changed um, if the PIB acts or any other act that seeks to harmonize and include some of these regulations in, you know, in, a, in, a, um, in an instrument that provides for everything with respect to the industry. So to this uh, end, we, um, um, the importance of the IB, um, PIB is, um, cannot be overemphasized and um, we look forward to the passage of the PIB to encourage the desired growth, a resource-rich um, resource industry such as um, Nigeria um, really, really true deserves. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Falashade. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, obviously, you gave us an overview of the royalties and taxation requirements to expect if operating um, licenses um, that one must apply for. Um, before you can also operate in the region and very importantly sustainability issues um, you know and protection of local communities so thank you very much for that Palashari. that was brilliant um thank you so we have tried to get shamsia back online and i'm hoping that it works this time um so shamsia can you confirm that you're online if you go off mute please yes <clears throat> yes yummy brilliant thank you very much apologies Apologies, that's okay. apologies. That's okay. That's okay. So we shall try one more time and fingers crossed it does go through this time around. Um, I shall once again share my screen on your behalf um, and you can start your um, your content from the effectively the third slide. So business considerations within the ambit of local content act. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to first of apologize to everybody for um, the internet interruption. Uh, I'm happy to be back on. So with um, no delays, I would like to start with um, the key provisions of the Nigerian um, Oil and Gas Industry Content Development Act. The key uh, provisions with respect to business considerations. Um, the first off is the first considerations that's given to Nigerians or independent operators. Um, in cases such as awarding of licenses, um, Nigerians are, are given first priority with respect to that, as opposed to um, foreign investors. Then with regards to services provided by Nigerians, Nigerians are, in such instances are given priority with respect to services. Then um, manufactured goods, uh, act in itself encourages the use of Nigerian made um, goods within the industry, the training of Nigerian staff. It is very key that um, in the industry, um, operators train their staffs, but in this instance, priority is given to the Nigerian staff. Priority is given to the Nigerian staff. Um, to emphasize the, um, is the requirement of the Nigerian content um, plan yearly to be submitted to the board by the operators. Now, part of that plan is the training your, your training plan for your staff. Now, what does the board, it informs the board that you have um, in the intention, you are intentional about promoting training your staff. Then we'll go to employment of Nigerians. We will go to the employment of Nigerians. We'll go to the employment of Nigerians. So, hello? Hello? Yeah, go, go ahead, Shamsia. We can hear you. Okay. Um, with regards to employment of Nigerians, yes, Nigerians are given first priority when it comes to employment. And to emphasize that is also um, um, the section 34 of the Act, which states that if for contracts above 100 million US dollars, it is expected that you should have in your agreement a labor clause, which stipulates that the minimum um, um, labor force should be as, as um, provided under the schedule, which is 75% minimum of your um, workforce with regards to whatever project that's been carried on. Then with um, retainer of Nigerian law firms, 
for rep uh, legal representation on financial institution. Yes, it is. It is. Um, par it is priority to give to engage Nigerian law firms for your legal representation and also Nigerian commercial banks for your financial transaction. Then I'll go on to talk about compliance with the provisions of the Act. This in itself is a, is a huge responsibility on um, all operators and industry to be compliant with the provisions of the Act. One of such requirements is to submit the submission of a yearly Nigerian content plan to the board. It's, um, it is pertinent that um, operators are compliant by the provisions of the Act and um, also in doing so, you are, you, um, in order if you um, fail of Failure to comply with the provisions of Act will enable the board sanction you. So it's very important that you you are fully in compliance. And by way of doing that, in in practice, usually you usually you find um, creators in the organizations they have um, a designated department for com uh, for compliance or a designated individual who is responsible for the um, document control, or better still. Um, engage um, law firms to carry out that responsibility because it's very important that you're compliant um, with the provisions of the Act, and you do and you do not want to be found wanting for um, for I mean wanting in that regard. Then um, I'll talk about expatriate quota. Expatriate quota is simply the <clears throat> amount of expatriate um, given within a period of time. Now the provisions of the Act permits for engagement of expatriates. However, there's a catch to it. And an, an expatriate can be engaged only in situations whereby um, certain roles cannot be filled by a Nigerian. So if there's no Nigerian that can carry out the res responsibility, then an expatriate can be engaged for such roles. But if a Nigerian can, then there'll be no need for an expatriate. So it should be on a need basis. Then I'll go to the minimum share capital. For application of um, for expatriate quota, it's very important that, according to the guidelines of the, of the Act, that the minimum share capital is 10 million naira share capital for you in order for an office to apply for an expatriate quota. If you're running your oil and gas below 10 million naira share capital, all you need to do is increase the share capital to 10 um, to 10 million share capital. But in practice, what I usually do as a lawyer, I advise my clients that at the instance of incorporation to be on the safe side to incorporate with the 10 million naira share capital. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so I then go to um, application through the board. Now, this may sound very easy, but it's one of the challenges that the board is faced with currently. Now, um, it is it is provided under the Act that you should seek, an operator should seek approval from the board before it can proceed to the Federal Ministry of Interest for its um, expatriate quota. So you need to, what some operators do is that they jump the gun and go straight to the Federal Ministry of Interest and get their expatriate quota. Yes, you can do that, I mean, because the ministry can issue a special quota, but however, it is a compliance issue that you are required to seek approval from the board before you can proceed to apply for expatriate special quota in, um, in the Federal Ministry of Interiors. And currently, there's, there, are, there are talks of trying to um, synergize within, between the board and the ministry as to um, how they can, how operators can be compliant and ensuring that they seek approval from the board before um, they apply under the Federal Ministry of Interior. Now, um, who can apply for an expatriate quota? This is also in itself a, another issue um, that um, the board is also faced with. Now, it's not um, the under the guidelines of the board, only operators or service companies can apply for an expatriate um, quota, can ask, uh, can apply for approval to apply for an expatriate quota. So, um, um, servicing, sorry, recruitment firms, manpower companies cannot do that. According to guidelines, it's only operators or service companies that can do that. Then with regards to succession plan for the Nigerians, it is um, when, when we have, it is required the minimum of two personnel on the studies for per expatriate now um, within a period of time. And in the act is stipulated for a maximum of four years. So what it is is that in that period, the Nigerian is supposed to study the expatriate. And upon um, the termination of the period, the, the period of time, the expert the Nigerian study is supposed to take over that responsibility of the expatriates. Now when that happens, the position in, in itself is become, becomes Nigerianalized, meaning that an expatriate can no longer take that responsibility. It's not a position for a Nigerian. And then the maximum percentage of expatriate management position um, 
as stipulated in the act, the maximum percentage for expatriate managing position is 5%. So it's very important. Not many know this, but it's very important. And this is in, in, in relations to um, in-country and out-country execution. And then lastly, I'll be talking about the contracts and bidding. So with, with contracts and bidding, it is required for just to send on quarterly basis a list of their contracts to the board the, uh, alongside um, certain documents such as maybe your invitation to tender, your list of um, bidders, your advertisement to the board for them to re review, evaluate, and approve. There's a process to it, so you're expected to um, send forth this to the to the board uh, on a quarterly basis. And then what, what happens after the board reviews and approves the um, setting and on the next quarter, the, um, the operators um, allowed to execute such contracts. However, this is not um, for any contract. It's only for contracts from 1 million US dollars upward, above, sorry, above 1 million US dollars, up, um, above 1 million dollars. Yes, so projects within that amount are the ones that are required to send their the list of um, are required for to be submitted to the um, to the board, um, and this is the same. This goes to um, approval for bidding as well. There's also a process to it. It's very important that you go by it. But if your contract is below the sum of one million US dollars, then you do not need the the board's approval. Then lastly, I'll talk about. Lastly, I would talk about the, the shadow. So what is what you can see here is not extensive. It's much more than this. I mean, we're talking about the oil and gas industry. It's much more than this. So what you can see is the description, the, the minimum Nigerian content, and the measurement. So what the, the shadow is all about is basically the minimum contribution of local content as it regards to manpower, resource materials, and services in the oil and gas industry. However, if um, there's a certain, if there are resources that are not in, uh, stipulated under the shadow, you can apply to the board for um, for a particular for a minimum minimum contribution. So yes, that's it about the the shadow, and I think I've come to the end of my presentation. I hope it has been helpful. I'm really sorry once again for the the breakdown in connection. Um, so in summary, I would like to employ um, Nigerians to. Um, comply fully with the provisions of the Act uh, for those that are in the industry and that want to go to the industry. It is a viable industry, however, you want to stay relevant and you want to make an impact in the economy, so it is safe that you are uh, in compliance with the provisions of the Act. Thank you. And back to you, Yemi. Thank you very much, Shamsia. Um, that was really insightful. Um, yes, I do, I do acknowledge the difficulties we had with the um, communications, but thank you for coming back online and, and concluding on your presentation. So with respect to what you spoke about, the business considerations, I think it's particularly important um, as if, you, if one is trying to do business with um, foreign entities, it's important to like both yourself and um, Falasha, they said about the 51% um, share capital, well, 51% ownership, um, business ownership by a Nigerian national minimum. Um, and also other things like the schedule, what that provides in terms of doing business and the opportunities open to nationals of the country. So effectively looking through that schedule, that Nodri said Act 2010, um, schedule gives you the opportunity um, to think up business ideas, to think up how you can equally add value to the oil and gas industry in Nigeria going forward. So I hope um, our viewers have learned a thing or two um, from, from that presentation. So that really concludes on the formal part of our, um, our presentations for today. We, as I said, it is an interactive session um, and all through we have hopefully um, well, answered some of the questions that might have come to mind and otherwise I hope you have had the um, opportunity to share your questions via the Q&A. If not, there is still an opportunity to do so. So from what we have um, already gathered from, from the viewers, we should just take uh, some questions um, and pass that on to the panel. Again, if we cannot get through all of this before um, say 7.40, 7.45 p.m. tonight, then please send us an email um, on ethicos at ethicos, sorry, ethico at ethicos.co.uk. And if you also wish to get in contact with any of the panelists today um, or myself, please do so via the um, email address as well. So without further ado, let's pick up the first question um, that is directed at the panelists. 
so we have from Chinedu or oh, hello Chinedu. Um, you've asked here that is it more efficient to focus on specific regulations to close gaps in the legal framework compared to waiting for the PIB as currently envisaged? So you spoke about the um, PIB Fadike. Would you like to answer this for us, please? Uh, yes, I would say while we wait for the PIB, it's um, we still have to comply with the present regulations while we wait for the PIB passage, but, and according to the Senate president, the bill will be passed before the end of 2020. But in the meantime, the Department of Petroleum Resources has specific guidelines for all the requirements and everything needed. The, the, there are guidelines already in place. So what we have to make do with those until the PIB is passed. And we have guidelines for obtaining um, permits, for um, permits, for guidelines for terminal operations, guidelines for flare gas measurements, and among others. So, yes, we have to just wait for it while we stick to the guidelines we have. Thank you very much, Fadike, for that. Okay, we should move on to the second question. Um, Adebayo. Adebayo asks if um, are current local content laws sufficient to increase participation by local players in the oil and gas industry, or do changes need to be made? So Shamsia, local content? Okay, um, to answer that question, I will go with the approach of 60-40. Um, 60 being that um, the, the regulation is quite extensive, it's informative. However, 40% will go to the challenges that the board is, is faced with currently. I think if we can address those issues, then it, 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 would, make, um, it would improve um, local content participation in the oil and gas industry. Now, I'll point out um, one being the issue of um, biometrics capturing. I know I didn't talk about that because I didn't have much time to do so, but um, biometric capturing is just a you know, the profiling of expatriates. Now, the issue with that is that um, according to the guidelines of um, the, the board, the Nigerian Content and Development Monitoring Board, you you're expect the expatriates are expected to go to um, BIOSA to carry out those biometrics. And for anyone in Nigeria, living in Nigeria, you know that that's quite a distance. And also there are certain issues with logistics and also it's, um, it's um, capital intensive and um, you also have to consider the safety measures as well. So for me, I would rather suggest um, since there are liaison offices around, why not have them take the biometrics? Um, why don't why not have the um, what, what you call the expatriates take their biometrics in the liaison offices there, or better still, uh, create centers whereby in each state whereby this can be taken place or again you can set out circular the board can set out circulars for operators to have a designated department for biometrics you know i feel if that happens it would be better it would um, encourage um, the participation of um, Niger nigerians in the oil and gas industry that's one then two i think um if time permits me though i would like to say um another issue would be that of um exploring i, I think i found um, somewhere in the Act, there's, I think Section 4 of the Act actually um, allows for a creation of an e-commerce market for a um, platform for oil and gas, for promotion of oil and gas um, goods for free flow of goods and services, and as well as um, promotion of um, uh, trans global industry transparent transparent um, governance all that it, it comes with a lot of benefits so for me considering the, the state of things now everybody's virtual we're all you know online now why not ex this is the perfect time to explore that now we, um, so for me i feel it would be a very good avenue to take um, advantage of it's real it's there it's permissible it's under the act it says that the board should create this platform so why not if not now and then thirdly i would um talk about the issue of succession plan. And I speak on this based on my own experience and practice. I find out that most, um, most operators struggle with finding suitable candidates to understudy the expert trade. So um, I would recommend a situation whereby there's a, some kind of partnership between the board and some institutions whereby you can find the suitable people that are more or less like a shopping uh, kind of structure whereby I don't know if it's right to use the word shopping, but where you can go in and engage 
certified individuals to understudy um, expatriate because I find out that lots of people complain that, oh, that's their problem. That's why they're not meeting up the succession plan because they're, they're, they're struggling to find suitable candidates. So if there's a, some kind of arrangement to that effect, I think they'll go a long way. And um, yeah, and then again, um, I, um, let me see what else. Yeah, uh, I would, um, let me see. I think that's all for now. <laughs> let me Thank allow you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shamsia. I mean, those are very practical answers that you've given there with regards, um, you know, the, the you know, pr provisions for biometrics or taking biometrics in, in other parts of the um, country, not just in Biosa State. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that, 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 would be, that would be quite practical. But with regards to what you said, um, and as far as my own personal experience is concerned, with regards succession planning um, and, and planning for that by, by companies effectively, um, so I believe there is something called the Nogistic, um JQS, um, which yes, that's the right. So, <laughs> that's correct. So on there, I understand that um, that um, in, um, local local or local by the Nigerian individuals could go there, could register on there, especially um, graduates or recent yeah those in you know polytechnic levels, recent graduates, and okay. through this um, website they're able to register and and register interest if nothing else on opportunities for training for um, for employment. For whenever such contracts, and of course there is the big contract in the country right now, the NLNG Train 7 project. So by all means, um, there, there would be room for improvement there, but thank you for those practical um, answers as to how the local content might, might cover um, additional areas that is currently falling short in. Okay, so I will take the next question from Sarah Dada. Sarah is asking about the legal framework um, and that it appears to be complicated. Um, Sarah says, what one change would you make to simplify laws to increase Nigeria's oil and gas industry competitiveness? So um, in, in, in the general framework mindset, may I invite Fola Shade again to, to talk to us? Alasha Day, are you there? If so, please unmute. Okay. Thank okay, yes. you. Yeah. Um, with respect to the question, legal framework appears complicated. Yes. Uh, one, what one change would I make? Um, basically, like I said in my presentation, I, um, I seek the passage of the PIB because it seeks to unify um, all the various and different um, legislations and regulations that we have with respect um, to the industry. Um, for me, I'm particular, I'll be most particularly, you know, interested in seeing that um, um, some of the powers, you know, vested in the minister is reduced. Um, we know, I know that um, for certain section 12 of the Petroleum Act vest um, absolute power and control with regards to policy formation and um, um, a whole lot of other um, responsibility on the person or the office of um, the Minister of Petroleum Resources. Um, even though the Petroleum Minister, you know, exercises some of these powers through the Department of um, Petroleum Resources, um, the DPR, um, you cannot take away the fact that, um, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So where you have um, one individual who controls another a parastatal, so to say, as it were, um, with respect to the grant of um, licensing and all other aspects in the industry, I, I think that person um, is a bit too powerful. So we want to look for checks and balances and find ways, you know, to reduce those powers so that um, people can, uh, participants and in the industry can compete can compete you know on a plain um, level field you don't need to know the minister to get a, um, a oil field license or know anybody in dpr and you know if um, if um, power is divested you know shared and then of course policy formation we know that um, by by virtue of our constitution um basically for uh, policy formation um is the exclusive responsibility of the legislative arm i would like to see um policy formation um, with respect to the um industry Industry, you know, fall, you know, ultimately the box will fall ultimately, you know, at um, um, at the at the table of um, the, the National Assembly, the House of Re Representatives, you know, because they have um, through their various constituencies, they have um, 
um, opportunities to interact with um, the general populace. You're able to interact with them. You're able to feel their mind um, and their and how they feel about um, certain aspects, especially um, host communities. And they can come back to the table, legislate, debate. You know, and I agree something that's you know um, competitive enough for everyone and enables everyone compete on on a plane and your know, level field. Thank you. That is very, thank you for that show. That's a very fair point. And like you said, you know, in terms of competitiveness, it's no, it's no secret that um, the oil and gas industry currently accounts for about 75% of Nigeria's revenue um, and 90% of, of the export revenue as well. So it would be, it would be good to see um, further competition, but, and in addition to that, of course, a divestment of, of, of power of, and of interest and in actually building other areas yeah other areas in the in the economy so thank you thank you for your response on that one for that today um thank you so i'll take the next question from Gwinga O. Oh. so Gwinga has asked have you critically reviewed the proposed petroleum industry bill does it actually solve all the issues um which are currently faced in the industry in brackets legal um legal inclusiveness um is gas utilization also covered in the bill now, do we have an answer for that? Um, Bill, again, question, so if I can. If you can hear us, unmute, please. Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Thank you, yes. Okay. Um, I would, the PIB is um, meant to alleviate and um, resolve a lot of issues currently being faced with the current acts and legislations we have. And um, after reviewing this bill, the area that I personally might find a little bit of um, deficiency is in the environmental policy. Um, this is, um, okay, according to the PIB, it seeks to provide for the establishment of a legal, fiscal, and regulatory framework for the petroleum industry in Nigeria and other related matters. And this implies that the bill covers all matters related to oil and gas in Nigeria, including environmental matters. But in section C, subsection one, um, it says the federal government shall, to the extent practicable, honor international environmental obligations and promote um, energy efficiency and provision of related, reliable energy and taxation policy, policy that encourages fuel efficiency by producers and consumers. I would say there's a lack of clarity in the core of that statement, and um, it shows some elasticity on how the government intends to handle matters relating to the environment and um, to stop issues like um, pollution and stuff that arise from you know the oil and gas industry and um, as the question about the gas utilization um, one of the regulators under the PIB governance bill that's the National Petroleum Regulatory Commission that's going to re um, replace the DPR they, they, they're going to establish a methodology for determining appropriate tariffs for, gra for gas processing and gra gas tra transportation and gas transmission. That's um, so far, in so far as matters relating to gas under the PIB. But um, I would say that um, this bill is still in more or less in process. And I believe that it's going to help resolve a lot of issues and make all the areas where we have um, duplicity of laws and um, confusion in the laws is going to help to resolve those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fadike. I mean, commitment is key on everyone's part. <laughs> so if the government, um, if the government wish to see an act or a bill, bill put right, then obviously that there must be clarity. And sometimes clarity comes through guidance. Um, and, and of course, in contractual terms, they could, they could look to reinforce some of that um, you know some of those those higher level requirements so it would be good to see how that PIB comes through if and when it does come through <laughs> um and with regards to tariffs you mentioned you know um the, the gas processing so it'll be yeah thank you thank you for that response really it it, it covers it I think um but if you have any further questions on that Gwinga please feel free to to ask again um we have an anonymous question here uh one anonymous user asking if so thanks to, for the enlightening presentation. Would it be more efficient to close gaps uh, in the legal framework compared to waiting for the PIB to be passed as currently envisaged? It's a very good question. Um, it is a very good question. And the 
truth of the matter is um, it, it's, it's down to the expediency of, of the House, of you know, reps, senators, and, and the, leg well, the legislators in Nigeria to, to put and process this. Uh, I think like every, every country, they, they face their own challenges, um, and maybe now more than ever, if they, if they according to you know, what, what Fadike told us about um, their timelines. So if they were looking to, to, to consolidate on that PIB by well, before the end of this year, or maybe, maybe, maybe government um, tenor, then I think it's, it's, it's anyone's question or any, you know, you, you can, you can put your finger in the air and guess a time frame. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Um, but in, in reality, I think it's, it's, it's the expediency of the government and of the house to, to determine what laws are passed in closing gaps. Um, I'll move on to the next question by Ayo Salami. Ayo is asking um, that there has been an evolution of Nigerian Content, content Act for the last few years, um, first requiring foreign companies to train and develop Nigerian nationals um, to, the current, to the current situation where preference is given to companies with 51 plus percent Nigerian ownership. Is there a subsequent iteration that we foresee coming up and in what kind of timeline? Okay, that's a good question, Aya. So um, might I ask either uh, Shamsia or Fadashade to come in and, and maybe tell us what, what might be in the pipeline for, for changing um, or improving on, on the act? Fadashade, may, may I go to you? Okay. Um, okay. Um... I'm, I'm aware that um, there's an amendment of um, the Content Act in the pipeline. I know that um, it has passed the first and the second reading. Um, one of the major challenges, you know, that um, the legislators are trying to address is with respect to the issue of who is actually Nigerian or a Nigerian company. You know, like I said in my presentation, there are quite um, a bit of confusion with respect to investments in the in, in Nigerian um, oil and gas industry, the government is really um, working towards, you know, creating an enabling um, business environment for investors. And in so doing, they want to actually, by that act, properly define what a Nigerian company is. And um, of course, um, I know that uh, I'm not very clear, but I know that um, there's um, an improvement with respect to 49% um, shareholding for international um, organizations or expatriates, as the case may be. Um, I know that the government is looking to push that up to about 80% as against 49%, um, but um, we are, it's still a, a, a bill and it's be, still being um, de debated. Um, that's um, one aspect of it. I also know that um, uh, government is looking at the structure of um, companies, the board structure. You know, government wants... Um, the government is actually willing to, you know, um, give 80%. You can actually own 80% thereabout if you're coming in to, to incorporate a company and then work in the Nigerian oil and gas uh, and participate in the oil and gas industry. But the government wants your board, you know, the board um, to have at least 90% uh, Nigerian content. So we don't know how that will play out. It's still being debated. You know, so, and um, of course, um, it's past the first reading, second reading at um, um, the lower house. So we're, we're, we're looking at, there's no time frame to it. There's no time frame to it yet. It's still, it's still in debate. So, but the ultimate, yeah, but the ultimate thing I want you to take away is that government um, realizes that, okay, we made a lot of um, um, policies regarding how to ensure that Nigerians are well trained, they become professionals in the industry, but we can't just stop there. We need investments from, you know, from international communities and we need to make them as, as comfortable as, as, as we can. So I believe government is trying, yeah. Thank you, Falashi. I ask you to please stay on. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a really good, good response because it's, um, whilst it is the responsibility of companies to ensure that when they sign that contract, and in fact, the DPR, when they do sign off, um, when they sign off um, the bid for work, um, that they are ensuring that there is there is a, a training plan in place, like Shamsia said as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very important that um, that overall that there is that opportunity provided for training for um, and for coaching, um, and therefore succession planning in the long run over four years of um, an expatriate position. So thank you for that response. Can I also put the previous question to you in case you had a different viewpoint um, with regards? Um, 
um, what could be done in the interim. So whilst waiting for PIB, could anything else be done in, in legal sense to close the gaps or the areas where we know that money is leaking out effectively? Well, government has put forth um, regulations with respect to um, um, corruption practices, if that's, if that's what you're talking about, definitely. We have um, the Corrupt Practices uh, Commission. They have um, powers to investigate, you know, where they feel that um, there's um, corruption or leakages of um, funds meant for this and that. They can investigate any parastatal. They can investigate... Um, any regulatory body or any fund or any board like the content board or any fund um they have absolute power to do that um, um that's on 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 one side and then we reserve to what can we do there's there's very little that you can do let's let's just be honest and and let's be honest because at the end of the day the act does prescribe absolute power not absolute but you know a considerable amount of power in the minister so whatever regulations um put out there by virtue of that act you know you know I, we have to remind ourselves that that act derives from the constitution so by by virtue of that act you just have to comply with whatever regulations you know comes from the the minister through the dpr or whatever means that he he chooses to you know, to, to, you know, issue those um, regulations and policies. So there's, I, I don't think there's very little, all that we can do is push for it, keep um, talking about it, and then, you know, keep um, reminding um, uh, our legislative arm to, you know, to also rise up to the occasion and, 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 you know, kick for, you know, the passage of the PIB, because at the end of the day, the industry as a whole stands to gain, Nigerians stand to gain, and any other investor, you know, you know, um, prospecting to come into Nigeria also stands to gain. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Shade. That was brilliant. Okay, we shall move on to the last next set of three questions. Um, I would... I would uh, take Dupree's question on what specific aspects of Nigeria's regulations do you see as discouraging investment in industry? Fadeke, can you come online and take that one for us, please? On mute, please. Thank you. So just like um, reiterating what the other panelists have said, we are still going to go back to the powers vested by virtue of the Petroleum Act in the Minister of Petroleum. You know, uh, the Section 2 of the Petroleum Act empowers the Minister to grant oil exploration licenses and um, OPLs as well, to search for, win, work, carry away, and dispose of petroleum. And Section 3 of the Act states that no refinery can be constructed or operated in Nigeria without a license granted by the Minister. But the same act states in section three, subsection two, that the licenses granted under this section shall be in prescribed form and be subject to prescribed terms and conditions or where no form terms and conditions are prescribed, the minister may decide to impose same. So this seems, this sounds a little bit like um, absolute power at the end of the day or discretionary power, so sure. I would say. And um, furthermore, some guidelines from the DPR, for example, for application of service permits um, in the industry, they are subject to review without notice at the discretion of the DPR. So a lot of prospective investors um, in the oil and gas industry who feel that these powers are a bit um, <laughs> absolute may be discouraged. And um, sure. I, that's all I'll see on that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you Thank much. you, Fadeka. I can see how a business coming in would like to know um, the likely outcome before they, they set foot in. So it does make sense um, to look at that diverse thing in, in the PI, well, according to the PIB and, and seeing how to, um, to encourage economic activity in country, definitely. Okay, we'll take the next one from Tolu. Tolu o is asking, does the legal framework encourage dispute resolution to be completed in Nigeria? Or are foreign juries jurisdiction still preferable? So for example, could the P&ID arbitration case against the federal government that was conducted in the UK be carried out in Nigeria with all parties assured of fair treatment? Now that's a very good question, Tolu. I remember seeing this in the news um, in the last week or two myself um, about the P&ID case. 
um, I think a, a, a law firm, sorry, a firm in, in probably in Scotland or so, taking um, the Nigerian government to task. So it will be quite a, quite interesting to, to hear your view. Um, might I ask Shamsia to, to take that one for us? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Yemi. Um, okay, to address that particular question, I will look at it from the perspective of basic principle of contract, more or less. It has very little to do with the legal um, framework, um, so to speak. So the issue here would be simple uh, principle of contract and as well as the um, rudiments of drafting of an agreement, or drafting of a contract. Now, in this particular example, the issue here was that um, the, there was a breach in contract. The federal government breached this um, responsibility under the contract by failing to carry out their responsibility. So there was a breach, and so it brought about dispute res resolution. Now, um, when I talk about um, the basic principle of contract, we look at it as you are you are bound by what you agree. So if you two parties come into agreement, whatever is agreed is expected to be carried out. Now, so um, but then that's why I come in to um, usually advise clients that before you sign any um, contract, any agreement, have a lawyer review it for you. You can even go further by carrying out. Um, due diligence, some kind of searches and all that investigations before you can execute. Now, I, um, reason for this is because of, um, you are expected as a counsel of your clients to look up for the best interest of your clients. So you look, at, you look into the way the contracts are being drafted. So the rudiments of contract would, um, of drafting a com of contract would play in here. So um, in this instance was more or less a dispute resolution clause that was drafted. Now, the clause there says, said that um, in case of a dispute resolution, they should, um, both parties should resort to arbitration. And um, arbitration being um, that it can be held in the United, it was agreed by both parties that it should be held in the United Kingdom. Now, the, that, and that in itself is a, is a venue of arbitration, but the, primarily the most important thing was the procedure, uh, what, what law was guiding the procedure, which was the Nigerian um, Arbitration and Concil Conciliation Act was what was used for the procedure. Now, the venue of the arbitration really doesn't matter so much. It's more or less a, um, based on uh, human factors, like maybe based on interest, you want a change of environment, so you take your arbitration to somewhere else, or you want to rule out the possibility of bribery and corruption, or uh, whatever it is. At the end of the day, it's, it's about agreeing by both parties, agreement by both parties saying that, okay, we want this arbitration to be carried out in a particular place, so you can have it in America, China, Jamaica, wherever, wherever you want to. But the, the most important thing is the procedure the law that was uh, that was being applied and was the Nigerian law. And it was clear that, so I'm, I know there's been assumptions, people are thinking, okay, because it was in the UK, so maybe that's why it was favorable to the, to the, to the, to P and, P and I, sorry, P, I and D, um, the, um, the, the UK firm. No, it's not, it, that's not the case. The case here was that there was a bridge, which was, uh, and was um, in, respect to like, the federal government failing to provide, um, I think, wet gas or so. So it was the bridge, not necessarily the, 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 the venue of the arbitration, and that didn't matter. It was the bridge that was the, was the crux of the matter. So um, in, basically, in answering this question, it's not, it's, uh, so whether it was in Nigeria, it could have been in Nigeria, more or less, it could have been in Nigeria, but it was a preference thing. Both parties decided that it should be carried out in um, the United Kingdom. Okay. So it could have been in Nigeria and still have a fair trial, but maybe because noble parties feel it would be better off to have it in the UK in terms of convenience or whatnot, or try to uh, um, or trying to rule out any case of bribery or corruption or so, of some sort, because arbitration itself is a private um, procedure. It's private, it's expensive and all that. So you want to make sure that you do the right things and not have any form of distraction. So that could be the case for wanting to take it to um, the uh, UK, but then again, you, it's an agreement. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Shamsia. Thank you very much for that um, response. So absolutely, at the start of any contract, I believe that, um, at least from my experience, that you agree beforehand where you decide 
where your cut of arbitration should be should um yes. should you fall into or should you fall out of bed effectively with your with your business partners so if that was pre-agreed then that definitely um, then became the the location for arbitration um, yes. and with regards to to could it have been done in nigeria then the answer is yes but that decision should have been made um in a timely fashion and this is these are the considerations like you say having a lawyer review your contract before you sign anything or before you're taking yes. the task in a foreign country and um, where you, yes. you have no legs or, or legal representation as it were so yes. thank you for, very much for that shamsia um i'll take the very last question now in the interest of time from adipera adipera is asking um, do you have examples of legal best practice from somewhere else in africa or globally that you would like to see adopted in Nigeria? Now, it's a very good question, Adipera. Um, uh, you know, local content requirements are coming up in, in all countries all over the world, um, especially as people seek to develop talent in country. Um, so, let, let, I mean, I, I would like to ask for Lashade if she could take that very last question for us um, and, and just share her views on that. For Lashade, over to you. Um, okay, um, with respect to that, um, I would like to say that um, quite a number of um, African countries have pretty much some of the issues that we have with regards to our regulatory framework in Nigeria, Angola, um, a bit of South Africa, Ghana. But um, it's um, worthy of note that Ghana has actually moved forward, you know, a bit you know, to a certain degree. Um, in 2018, um, they passed the Petroleum Exploration and Production um, Regulation. And by that um, regulation, Ghana has actually codified um, its procedure. You know, they operate a very transparent procedure with respect to their word of contracts and um, oil licenses in their country. As a matter of fact, their procedure, you know, involves um, evaluation through their um, their national their parliament because they they operate a parliamentary system so they they if you if you're interested to bid you know for um, an oil license in Ghana for instance um, your bid you know is is um, evaluated openly there's no secret to it um, it's, it's operated openly and then everyone can see the criteria the criteria are well spelt out in that very um, regulation um, the terms of your contract in the event that you're granted that contract um, uh, or the oil um, mining lease, you know, the terms of it, how it operates, your, um, the, the fiscal regime, everything is provided for in that very regulation. You know, I would, um, I would like to see um, a day where that can happen in Nigeria. So, for instance, um, they, play, they play a very primary um, preference to your ability to have financial, your financial backing. We want to know how financially ready are you to take on the contract or, you know, to mine um, an oil lease when granted to you. They also want to see how experienced you are. That's your technical um, capabilities. They take it um, seriously. Then they also want to see your content act. You know, they want to see your your content, uh, um, your content in terms of um, um, using um, indigenized um, contractors, you know, or subcontractors in your contract. They want to see that if you're coming in as an expert trade. So, but chief of all is the fact that they have a transparent system. And that transparent system is not vested in one person's discretionary power as against what we have in Nigeria. The parliament takes that decision solely. You know, they take it, they debate on it, you know, albeit and it's open. Everyone can see what the criteria are. If you are dropped, everyone knows why you're dropped. You know, as, as against Nigeria, you know, the last um, 2020 regulation says that um, um, you're evalu you'll be evaluated, but um, if you are dropped, the minister doesn't owe you a, a, a particular um, um, explanation as to reason why you're dropped. You know, after investing so much, you know, to bid for um, an oil mining lease, you, at least you should, should, you know, get a feedback as to why Indeed. you were not successful, you know. Exactly. But that doesn't happen in Ghana. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. And I'm looking forward, you know, to that day and that time where that um, obtains in Nigeria. 
people once again people need to have confidence in the system that if they're here to do business whether locally or international players that they will do business and that they will be considered fairly thank you for um for Lashade for that and let's let's hope for for more out of the system um i only have time for one more question i'm afraid um as i am being prompted as well from from the team in the background and we are conscious of time um so i'll take one last question maybe we'll try and squeeze in the second one Aya salami i, I recognize and, and acknowledge your question I think this has sort of been taken care of in some aspects of what um, the ladies have said so far. So Ladi, I'll take Ladi's question. Um, Ladi is asking that the Dangote refinery is nearing completion. And um, it will be good that if the federal government imposes very high tax, um, sorry, it will be good if the federal government imposes very high tax on any imported processed crude and well, crude oil. And, and other maybe maybe condensates. This will ensure that we are almost 100% self-sufficient. Um, so maybe that's actually a statement he's, he's, he's making there. Um, I would say very quickly in response to that myself, unless any of the other panelists would like to jump in to add to that. Um, I don't know if, if they're looking to impose any restrictions immediately on, on import. Of course, the PIB also looks at um, you know, the fuel subsidy and the issues around that. Um, like we said, in terms of money leaking out once again, um, and on or maybe over propping the um, you know the economy effectively through through government involvement, um, but with regards to taxation is 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 questionable. We all know that taxes end up on the consumer side because you know commodities end up going going, going up um, in response to that. If if people are if the businesses are having to pay more um, upstream, so. It would be good to be 100% self-sufficient. Self Having said that, it would be good to finally see um, oil and gas produced in Nigeria, refined in Nigeria, distributed in Nigeria, and exported um, for additional revenue. Thank you very much for that, Ladi. Um, might I just thank all the panelists for today? Thank you, our viewers, for your time um, and, and just you know just just being here with us today. This presentation will be uploaded on onto YouTube over time. Um, and um, if you have any other questions, please keep them coming. Um, our email address is ethico at ethicos.co.uk and we're always going to be happy to hear from you. If you'd also like to be in touch with any of the panelists um, or with the, the executive members of, of the team, please let us know again via the email contact. If we've not been able to answer any of your questions today, my sincere apologies um, in the interest of everyone's time, please email us and we would hope to respond to you on an individual level. So, um, that wraps up our presentation for today. I should make uh, one last remark that the next webinar is going to be on decarbonizing energy in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the tentative date for that is 15th or the 22nd of August, um, 2020. So if you can, please join us for that live. Um, and once again, we would always seek to upload um, our content on YouTube. So thank you for joining us. It really has been a pleasure. I've been your host, Yemi Obi, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye-bye.